next round with the Pacific Research Institute. I'm your host, Romina Ichon. This podcast is a recorded panel discussion from PRI's second annual policy conference in Sacramento. This panel focused on entrepreneurs, the mainstay of California's economy. The state's new law reclassifying many independent contractors to full-time employees has put the livelihoods of many entrepreneurs and independent contractors at risk. Our panel of distinguished speakers discusses this issue as well as reforms that will help entrepreneurship thrive in California. The panel includes John Capitec of Capitec Strategies and former state director of the National Federation of Independent Businesses, Lorraine Salazar, immediate past chair of the California Restaurant Association, and PRI's own Damon Dunn, fellow in business and economics. Thanks for joining us. Uh, As I mentioned, next is our panel on entrepreneurship. There has been a great deal of discussion at the Capitol about the future of work in the state of California. Policymakers, academics, and others are exploring ways to help Californians who will be disrupted by the technology revolution and the growth of artificial intelligence. Unfortunately, from my point of view and many here, the legislature took a big step backwards last year by enacting Assembly Bill 5. This Uh, misguided um, uh, measure imposes significant restrictions on who is an employer and who is an independent contractor. It's a 19th century solution for a 21st century problem. The immediate effect has been to take away job opportunities for many Californians. Going forward, it will take away people's freedom and to, to be their own boss and create the next big innovation. PRI has explored these issues extensively. In breaking down barriers to opportunity, PRI makes the case that policymakers must embrace entrepreneurship if we are to expand economic opportunity and lift people out of poverty. Our very distinguished panel today is going to explore these themes. As your program notes, Our panel was originally going to be moderated by the author of this study, Breaking Down Barriers, Dr. Wayne Weingarten, but unfortunately, uh, he came down with a flu and he lives in Virginia, so he couldn't make it. Fortunately, it was the flu and not the coronavirus. (laughs) (laughs) We've called upon Tim Anaya, our Director of Communications, uh, Senior Director of Communications, and our Sacramento office to fill in uh, Wayne's shoes, and I'm sure Tim will do a wonderful job. So please welcome Tim Anaya. Well, this is the first of a couple of times when I'm going to be filling in this afternoon, and I was kind of reminded thinking of this today. Years ago on one of those big award shows, uh, the great Tony Danza was designated as the, quote, designated acceptor for everybody who wasn't there to accept their award. (laughs) So literally, every time somebody won and they weren't there, he had to traipse up and back to the stage, and it kind of became the running gag of the day. I mean, I'm not exaggerating when I say he probably jogged up to the stage at least 15 times for people who weren't there. So, friends, today, I'm the Tony Danza of PRI Sacramento (laughs) Conference. Obviously, we're disappointed that Wayne couldn't be here today, Um, but we have for you today really an all-star team of panelists who are here to talk about an issue that is a big focus for PRI, um, and that's entrepreneurship. So we'll do our best to carry on without Wayne. So before I introduce the panelists, I'd like to kind of set the stage for our discussion today. So obviously, we're at a time of significant economic expansion. You know, you see it every day, every time I check my 401k. You know, the stock market is booming. The economy is growing. You know, we see unemployment in California nationally are at all-time lows. But yet, despite this, California continues to lead the nation in poverty. And there's a lot of uncertainty about how we grapple with issues like um, how technology will affect the future of work. And in 2019, as Sally mentioned, this manifested itself with the fight over the very controversial AB5. And this new law, uh, for those who aren't familiar with it, set forth who is an employee and who is an independent contractor in California. 
Now, apart from that battle, and that certainly generated many headlines, there are a lot of other state laws and regulations that amount to what we call government barriers to opportunities. And in Wayne's series, uh, Breaking Down Barriers to Opportunity, and the copies of the first two papers are in your uh, gift bag today, Wayne argues that one of the most important things we can do to lift people out of poverty, empower our communities, and address issues like income inequality is for policymakers at every level of government to embrace entrepreneurship. And by reforming or removing these obstacles that make it very difficult for people to start their own business, to hire people who are out of work, or create that next big California innovation, we can, through the power of the free market, help people move up the economic ladder and move into the middle class. And we can also help immigrants, many of whom arrive to the U.S. without the knowledge of all of these government obstacles to secure the better life that they sought by coming here. So today, our, free market, our panelists here are going to share their stories and also discuss how the free market can empower more Californians to be their own boss and set their own work schedules and deal with these issues of technological disruption and also lead the way for that next big creative California idea. So with that, let me introduce our distinguished panelists today. First, we're pleased to have Damon Dunn, who is a Pacific Research Institute fellow in business and economics. Damon writes the Free Markets 101 column for our uh, Right by the Bay blog. And he's the author of the recent PRI issue brief, My Life in Poverty and Why Socialism Doesn't Work. And as we mentioned earlier, he's working on a fantastic new book for us on basic income and all of these issues that will uh, be coming out later this spring. So apart from his uh, PRI affiliation, Damon is a very successful real estate developer and investor and businessman. And he's also a former collegiate and pro football player. He and I always tease one another about Stanford versus USC football. Uh, <laughs> and he was also a Hoover Institution Fellow from 2011 to 2013. Please welcome Damon Dunn. <laughs> Next we have with us John Kabatek. Now John is a very familiar uh, sight in, uh, in these parts here. Um, John, through his firm, Cabotech Strategies, is one of the most effective and universally well-regarded government affairs professionals here in Sacramento. And he has a lengthy record of public service in addition to um, his daily work. In the Governor Pete Wilson administration, he served uh, as the appointment secretary responsible for finding qualified applicants for eight, more than eight different state agencies. Um, in the Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger administration, he served as the Director of External Affairs, and his office was right next to mine, so we got into all sorts of trouble in that corner of the, uh, of the Governor's office. Uh, later, he served as Vice President of the California Restaurant Association, and then he was recruited by America's Voice of Small Business, the National Federation of Independent Business, and he served as NFIB's California State Director for eight years before launching his own firm. So please give a round for John Kabatek. <laughs> and finally, we're so pleased to be joined by uh, Lorraine Salazar. Lorraine and her brother Carla, the third generation partners for Sal's Mexican Restaurants. And if you're ever in their neck of the woods, as I have done, you must stop in and enjoy. It's the best foods you're going to have for miles around. So that's my free commercial for today. <laughs> um, Sal's Mexican Restaurants was started by their father, Sal, in 1942. And he wanted uh, to provide a better life for his family, more than he could do so working in the fields picking peaches. So that ultimate entrepreneurial vision has grown today to a very successful business with more than 150 employees. 
So in addition to her day-to-day -day job, which keeps her very busy even today, um, Lorraine is a very passionate advocate for small business concerns. She's very active across the street at the Capitol and in Washington, D.C., and she's received many honors for her community work, and she's held many leadership positions. She's the immediate past board chair for the California Restaurant Association. She was a mayor, a member of Fresno Mayor Lee Brand's transition team, and she now serves as the co-chair of the mayor's advisory committee. She's also a member of the California State University Fresno Foundation Board of Directors. I don't know where you have all the time of the day to do all these things. <laughs> Uh, in the past, she was appointed by Governor Schwarzenegger to serve on the California Partnership for the San Joaquin Valley, and she was a co-convener of that group's higher education and workforce development group. So please welcome Lorraine Salazar. So uh, to start out with, we're going to invite uh, Damon Dunn to come up to the podium here, and he's going to share uh, his perspective on uh, our topic today. Thank Damon? You. Thank you. Give me a two-minute warning, Tim. I will. Seriously. <laughs> uh, so if you want to read a lot of good content, uh, go to pacificresearch.org, and you're going to find a lot of data on a lot of papers I've written to cover this topic. I was chosen to speak about this from the impact of a community, particularly going into low-income communities. And what you find in these communities where I grew up, a lot of it's about what you believe, what you believe about yourself, what expectations you have. When I look back on being able to make it out uh, and I look at my friends who were not, it wasn't that they had zero um, beliefs or zero expectations is that they had low expectations and then they met them. So today I want to address uh, a, a piece of that and it's going to be a little bit more emotional. So I'm glad you guys are here because you're going to have a special moment today. Let me read something um, which all of you are familiar with. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in the great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived can so de and so dedicated can long endure. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what these men have done here. That from these honored dead, we have taken the increased devotion for the cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. I grew up really poor. My mom had me at 16. My father was killed when I was three years old. I lost three friends to murder by the time I was 15. And I lived in a trailer with my grandparents, slept in a bed with two uncles for the first 12 years of my life. We didn't have hot water, had to boil it on the stove, pour it into the bathtub. And then we took turns taking baths and I was the youngest. So I went last and you could feel the grit at the bottom of the tub. Uh, we had mayonnaise sandwiches two or three days a week, you know, to have for food. And I look back on that condition that we grew up in we had food stamps and government cheese and free and reduced lunch. We had all the welfare programs and benefits that you would think that people that are in that poverty would need. One thing I've learned as I've grown is that things have changed from um, racial segregation and racial economic issues. It's more socioeconomic because I grew up in rural Mansfield, Texas, which was an all white conservative area living in a trailer. And then I moved with my mom when I turned 12 into inner city Dallas, Texas, where I lost my th three friends to murder. And that was all black, all liberal. And what I found by living in both of these communities is that they shared the exact same hopes. They had the exact same situations and issues in their community. They felt like they faced gangs. They felt underappreciated. The schools were underfunded. And lack of access to technology, broken families in both communities. And they wanted the same things for their children. They wanted their children to be able to have a, uh, more wealth and a better future than what they've had. They wanted them to be able to go to college, to be able to buy a home, to be able to retire, po possibly to be able to live uh, and leave behind uh, an inheritance. And so I was able to transition out through the belief that I had that my mom taught me because she was the first person to go to college in our family. And I learned some things in my education and on my journey. When I got to Stanford University and I uh, met my college roommate, we ultimately, after I played in the NFL, went into business together. We became real estate developers and we took a company. His dad gave us a million bucks in 2001. We turned it into $163 million and I retired from 2008 until 2015. Had a great career in real estate development. And then I ran for office a few times, <laughs> spent a lot of my own money doing it. Uh, they don't give that back to you if you guys are wondering about that. It, I spent a million dollars running for mayor of Long Beach. I wish I didn't do that. Yeah. I, I take all that back now. 
Um, but I learned a lot. I learned a lot about entrepreneurship. See, when I was in those businesses that we were running, and the one I'm running now, which is in private equity, I work for a family office, and I manage $150 million of their private money. I buy companies for them, and I meet with investment bankers every day. In all the meetings that I go to, all white men, a few white women, we sit in meetings with investment bankers. That's all I spend my time with, meeting with investment bankers to understand, um, you know, what businesses they're selling, what are the financials, let me see your, your income statements and your balance sheets. Every meeting I was in when I ran that real estate development company, all white men, few white women. And it made me start to think about why people like AOC, when she gets elected, that what she grabs for are these government programs as opposed to something that's about entrepreneurship. And it's not because she doesn't, care. It's because she doesn't know. She's never owned a business. She doesn't sit in the meetings that I'm in, and a lot of minorities don't sit in these meetings. And I started to realize that there are a lot of people who are on the left that are very frustrated, and all they know is what's happened since the war on poverty began, which is let's allocate and manipulate government funds, let's create these community organizations, they call them community organizers, and let's try to find government resources in local government, in state governments, in federal governments, and then that's a win because that's what Saul Alinsky says, that's what Cesar Chavez said, that's what Barack Obama's done. These people, they go in, they understand that I can get a win if I can manipulate government finances, but they don't have the experience to understand how to be entrepreneurs. You know what they would learn if they were entrepreneurs? They'll learn what I learned, and I learned it because I was able to go to Stanford University. I learned that, you know what, there's a benefit to having access to capital gains tax rates, paying 20% versus paying whatever your marginal tax rate is. There are years, and I'm embarrassed to say it, where I made millions of dollars and only paid 1%, 2% in taxes because of appreciation, depreciation because of amortization schedules, because of uh, 1031 exchanges, able to sell properties and forward the, to trade the proceeds into new assets and then be able to not uh, pay taxes on that timeline. They don't understand that. So they, don't, they think that it's trickled down and it comes out to them slowly because they're not business owners. So they never get the chance to understand it. And then they're also hurt by the fact that the people in their community that are involved in entrepreneurship, the guys like Mark Zuckerberg, Mark doesn't go back and tell them that, you know what, this is how you code. This is how banks underwrite a loan. This is how you start a business. He goes back and he says, you know what he says? He says, you should shoot for universal basic income. President Barack Obama, he holds up a big flag about Obamacare, and then he leaves office. You know what he does? He makes tens of millions of dollars by leveraging his brand, by using capitalist principles. I've got a huge audience. The Kardashians do this. Everyone who builds some audience, they do it. Anyone who started a social media platform, you have millions of people that want to read your books, millions of people that want to watch you on Netflix. You sign a deal with Netflix, him and his wife, and they signed a $50 million deal. He's got a book deal, I think, worth $20 million uh, on his memoir. He leveraged the capitalist principles to go out there and build tremendous wealth for himself. But that's not what he goes back and he teaches people in the communities I grew up in. It's all about community organizing. It's all about manipulating government resources. So that frustrates me to a great degree. They don't know. So it's important for people like myself to go back and to share. And that's why I created what's called the Long Beach College Prep Academy, where we help young people go to college. And I've sent 50 kids every single year for the last five years to college. And now we have the school district has taken over funded. I funded it. I spent $250,000 to fund it for the years that I ran it. The school district now has put it into their five-year budget. So when we think about entrepreneurship and the importance that going back into a community that it plays, that's the importance. We're African Americans particularly have had success at building wealth are areas where we've had access. Access to entertainment, access to sports. And we've done well where we've had access, but there are not enough of us that are in finance, or not enough of us that are in private equity, not enough of us that are in real estate development, that own land, are able to go back and teach these principles. So it's incumbent upon people like myself. I understand the frustration with stagnant government that we've seen. We've lost the ability to get the 20% done. We disagree 80%, but that 20% was always able to get done. Tip O'Neill, Ronald Reagan, Bill Clinton, and uh, New Gingrich, they were able to get the 20% done. We've lost the ability to do that in our government. Thank you. But I want you guys to know that there's reason to have optimism. And I get it. It's gonna be a big fight happening in this next political race. I get it, the whole thing about impeachment. I understand all, everything that's going on, but I want you to have optimism. I 
think back about Abraham Lincoln's words. And I'm encouraged because of who we are and what our identity is. We're Americans. It means something to be American. Revolution. Great Depression. World War I, World War II. We made it through Korea, made it through Vietnam, made it through Jimmy Carter. <laughs> but we're resilient. And this is what I know, that if we can't run out of a problem, we will walk. If we can't walk, we'll crawl that if we don't have a shovel, we'll dig ourselves out with a spoon, and if we don't have a spoon, we'll dig ourselves out with our hands because that's who we are, that's what we do. We're American. This country's in good hands. There is new leadership that's coming to the surface. Thank you. Well, John, I don't envy being in your shoes right now. <laughs> but. We'd like to welcome up now John Kabatek, who's going to give more of a state perspective on these issues as well. John. Right. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you, Sally. Good to see you. And thank you, PRI. Uh, you are a hard act to follow, Damon, so I will say that as well. And um, go Trojans, by the way. There you go. Um, right I, I don't exactly have Abraham Lincoln, or I do not have that kind of poetry to cite. A little bit of, but a little bit of poetry, a little bit of poetry of Robert Frost, and, and it starts like this, and this is kind of how some may feel in Sacramento these days. Two roads, two roads diverged in a yellow wood, a poem by Robert Frost, and I took the one less traveled by, and now I'm freaking lost. <laughs> it's not as eloquent, but I'm trying. I'm trying. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it. I'm uh, grateful to be here and represent, uh, yes, I have been very blessed to represent small business for a number of years. Uh, and as the California director of the NFIB, and so it was just so great. PRI is just such a great organization. We have great partnership and we've done great things. And you guys are just always speaking the honest truth. Uh, when it comes to entrepreneurship, you know, it is one of those things that uh, we're very, very proud to represent and continue to push forth to make sure it continues. And I, I'm really gl grateful to have, like, here in the audience, I see some members. Bob Naylor is a member of NFIB. Bob, thank you. And also, you were, you've worn a couple other hats in your life, I know. <laughs> Uh, and Alzada Knickerbocker is a great story. Uh, she is actually the owner, if you ever want to get a book, this is my egregious plug, in addition to finishing a great meal at Sal's Mexican restaurant. Uh, Alzada's business has been the avid reader and the active reader. She had a business here downtown, um, certainly one on Broadway, and then now has had the active and the avid reader in Davis. And she is the quintessential small business owner and entrepreneur. She is actually hanging up her hat, ha handing over the reins to somebody in about two days, officially, after how many years, Alzada? 33 years as a great small business owner. And she's the epitome of the California dream. And I will tell you that when we talk, when I was thinking about the idea of what we should be talking about today, the real epitome is somebody like Alzada Knickerbocker, who has really worked hard. She's done a great job as a small business owner, hiring people, contributing to the Davis economy, uh, which is always a challenge being in the Davis economy, but uh, uh, always uh, just out there persevering. And you know, one of the things that you know that's really critically important to remember is how much small business owners really make up in California. About 99.2 percent of all small all businesses are small businesses, uh, and they create two thirds of all net new jobs. I always say they're the big kahuna, and I was in a surf community at one time, uh, but they get the short end of the driftwood. Uh, and I say that only in that small businesses on average, and this is according to NFIB standards and, and data, small businesses on average pay three times more to comply with um, taxes than larger businesses and corporations, 29% uh, more to comply with regulations, and they are usually the, usually more often than not, the target of frivolous lawsuits in California. In fact, 40% of ADA frivolous lawsuits in the nation stem from California which is just shocking. So uh, it's, it's a daily grind for somebody like Alzada and so many others out there. I ran into somebody on uh, K Street not too long ago. It was uh, another lobbyist. Uh, but uh, he looked at me, he stopped me, and he said, you know how to start a small business in California, don't you? I said, no, no, tell me. Tell me. I should know. He said, well, you open up a big business and wait. <laughs> I said, funny as that is, it's kind of sadly true. But... Uh, what I would say is this, when we're talking about the positives, because we were talking to Dr. Weingarten and others about the real positives, 
we want to make sure that we can remove those barriers. When I say remove those barriers, we are looking at some issues, and, and you know, Tim, we may get into the issue of AB5 a little more, maybe in the questions and that kind of thing, but that really strikes a, 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 a through the heart of, again, not just the small business owners, but certainly the entrepreneurs, the single moms, the seniors, the teenagers, those who are looking for some flexibility and freedom. Uh, the challenge is that there is such a complexity to this issue that even as George Skelton, who is not necessarily your, your right center uh, columnist, has even asked the question, you know, when you're looking at actually how you would qualify an employee in the course of natural course of that business, take Staples Center for example, you know, George actually identified that as an example. Because there are, because the nature of Staples Center is actually music and performances, now we are we to now consider um, musical acts and the bands that perform at Staples Center, um, as well as the Lakers now to be considered the actual employees of Staples Center versus others who would be out there as contractors. It's a very complex law, and I think at the end of the day, what we're trying to find from our elected officials is making sure they understand that, th that when you look at a policy like that, you're not striking it at the heart of big business and corporations, although small businesses are affected very differently. You are hurting the mom and pops, the Alzadas, the others out there. Looking at AB5, for example, we have a guy in Southern California who has got a jewelry store. Um, he actually has outsourced the jewelry settings from his jewelry store. He's the vendor. He's the seller. But to be able to outsource the, sell, the fitting and the placement of those diamonds and those types of things, now those individuals are now going to have to be considered full-time employees, and he's going to have to basically wrap it up because he just there's no way he can do that. Plus, the other part to point out is those people who do the settings are individuals who enjoy that freedom, who have enjoyed having multiple opportunities to serve. Um, so that is a real challenge that we're finding with AB5 is people are just not understanding it. When you talk, when you talk about what we can do to remove the barriers, we need to make sure we're passing legislation and policy that people understand. The, there's a California Consumer Privacy Act that was passed, uh, that was signed by Governor Brown um, a couple years ago before he left office, but it is 33 pages long and more than 10,000 words. But it basically gives uh, customers the ability to walk into a lot of businesses, demand that their personal d information about them, and that could be anything from a video clip to actually uh, their browsing history with that company, now needs to either be stored by the employer um, and provided to that person, that customer, or deleted. Uh, how's a small business owner going to do that? So they're either going to have to um, hire, do it themselves and stop everything in their tracks, or frankly, they're going to have to um, provide that and hire an IT company. Uh, the Attorney General just did a study, uh, the Attorney General who's charged with enacting these regulations just did a study and had a research firm that found that it will affect, that issue alone is going to affect 75% of California businesses and it's going to, in the first year for a business with fewer than 20 employees, cost about $50,000 to implement. So I don't know how a small business does that. Another NFIB member of ours in Southern California said, if that's actually the case, it will put me under. So the first thing that we would ask is when we're talking about um, business issues is whether it's AB5, the Consumer Privacy Act, is we have to demand that our elected officials have more public hearings, that they actually understand the nature of businesses in their district, uh, and make sure that they understand what that means. Damon's right. There are... Um, I think a lot of the time there are some who just simply don't know. You know, AOC may very well be an example of that, where they just don't know because you're right. What we hear from people is uh, they just haven't signed the, the front side of a check, right? Uh, but I think in many ways that is very true. So on what I would say if I were looking at that at face value is we are encouraging, if you are a small business owner, raise your hand, by the way, if you uh, have, have a small business owner of some sort. Raise your hand if you've worked in a small business of some sort. Raise your hand if you've had a lemonade stand. Anybody out there? <laughs> All right, good deal. Regardless of it, I think it's so important, whether it's a lemonade stand or the avid reader or what have you, it is so important, first and foremost, that you make sure that your electeds at every level have a chance to come see your business, have a chance to understand what you're doing, talk to your employees. It sounds very cliche and kind of sort of sounds like, duh, 
But at the end of the day, that's really important. We're doing that this year. Instead of a lobby day here in Sacramento, we're doing something called Main Street Meets the District. So we're actually going to be inviting legislators to the districts to actually not only meet with their, the folks in their district, their constituent small business owners, but actually spend some time shadowing, throwing on a hat, actually doing some transactions, and actually looking and understanding the nature of that business. So that is really important, I think, is making sure you, they understand. Damon's absolutely right. Some just simply don't know. Many do know, and they just, they just feed it another trough. And that is all the more reason, I think, that um, as we heard earlier, it is so important that people, you know, get engaged and put their money behind candidates who do talk the talk and do make sure that you're doing that. The only second thing I would mention, because the time's limited, is in addition to making sure that you're educating and you're also demanding from elected officials that they, that they hold hearings on issues, because they didn't do that with the CCPA. They did very little of that with um, the AB5, and people now are caught in the dark trying to, trying to comply. But the second thing I would really encourage is, is I would demand that you know, there be more opportunities for career technical educations. Not everybody has a four year or eight year um, pathway to success. But, and I think as, as Lorraine is, I'm sure, nodding her head, many go into the food industry, but there are great career tech programs in schools, in high schools, and those oftentimes, what, does, what gets lost in the discussion is those oftentimes lead people to an educational excitement and an energy to want to learn more. So if some people say it's one or the other, we find a lot of people who go in as voc vocational ed, they become so successful, um, and then they actually want to learn more. So they do go to a college or university to take other classes. So we got to encourage, I think, the governor and our legislators to continue to advance more career tech, vocational programs. And then third, I would just make sure that as you're out there, um, sadly, I would say one of the most important things you can do in the business community is get make sure you do have good legal counsel. Uh, I think we've got, it, it, there are so many laws coming at us right now that it is so important that you understand uh, what is coming at you and understanding that, the, the different nuances of legal issues. So I really appreciate the opportunity. I know that we're going to have some questions. Um, yeah, I will say on this one note that, uh, you know, uh, Tim, you did mention that you're the Tony Danza, so I want to get you back up here. And I think with the fact that you're Tony Danza, you did answer the question, who's the boss? That would be you. <laughs> so um, be involved, be educated, demand your legislators um, listen to you, get educate career tech education as a focus, and make sure, again, that there are a lot more Alzada Knickerbockers that can continue to survive and thrive as we remove these obstacles. So thank you very much. And now we'll bring to the stage uh, to share her thoughts and experiences, Lorraine Salazar. Thank you, Tim. Um, I'm honored to be with these distinguished two gentlemen who have really accomplished a lot. Um, my background is I am third generation immigrant uh, family member, uh, but I'm second generation business owner. And my dad started the business in 1942 along with my grandfather, grandmother. My grandmother was packing lunches for the uh, migrant laborers that worked for Southern Pacific Railroad and were working in the fields. And my dad was the eldest of eight children. My grandfather worked for Southern Pacific. And he, my dad saw, had an idea. He was working in the fields and he said, you know, there's a better way for us to make a life as the eldest of eight children. And they knew that education was important, so school was not compromised. But my dad compromised his education by not graduating from high school, taking that summer when he was 17 and starting a little taco stand that he called Sal's Mexican Restaurants with lumber and chicken coop wire that he bought from a ranch hand a farmer in, uh, in 1941. So 1942 was the start of the business. And so when you think about 1942, you know, we had the start of World War II. We had... Uh, the um, uh, Pearl Harbor. And you think about what resources were available. It was just true grit and their savings and really doing uh, what I call farm-to-table products, going to the farmer, getting the eggs, getting the corn to mill, you know, doing everything from hand. So my dad had true grit. And it was because of that grit that, like most immigrant families that have come to the United States, 
where have they been able to make their contributions? It has been by opening a restaurant. This is what they know how to do. If they have other skills that require licensing that they can't get licensed quick enough, they go into the restaurant business. This is what they know how to do, the food industry. So I want to talk a little bit about the food industry and and where we are today. Uh, As I said, my dad started in 1942, and I think he was really kind of at the pinnacle of his business and well-known by the 1960s. We are a 77-year-old uh, restaurant company, unheard of, three locations. Um, we are now educating our, our third generation uh, in the business, those that are wanting to, and they are facing many more different challenges than what my dad faced and even what my brother Carl and I faced when we came into the business because I have now been back in the business it will 29 years and I'm a graduate of UCLA sorry guys uh, <laughs> graduate of UCLA and my dad certainly his hope was not for me to be in this business and I'm the oldest of, of four I have three brothers um, and I worked outside of the business in LA and I was there for 16 years but I came back I, I'm, a, I'm a boomerang backer and it's because I had hit a ceiling in corporate America where I was working and saw that, you know, if I wanted to increase my capacity to make money, if I wanted to have flexibility with my schedule, if I wanted to have the ability to help and develop other people and develop our family, and though we would be considered, uh, you know, middle class, uh, working family, being able to lift, again, the next generation, you know, it was through entrepreneurship. And many people find this in the restaurant industry, in the food industry. And when you look at today's environment, this is still one of the industries, last industries, other than going into, you know, doing something on the internet and social media, um, where you can start with nothing and start at a dishwashing job, janitor level, and work your way up to be the CEO of the company or to own your own business. And I can give a number of examples within our own business where we have employees who went on to own their own businesses. And like John said, many of them will go back to school given that, you know, opportunity because they realize that they need additional skills to be able to go back. So let me a couple of facts about where we currently are in the restaurant industry. We are the largest private sector employer as an industry in the state of California. We are the largest generator of sales tax in the state of California. 95 cents of every dollar goes back into the operations of our business. Translated, five cents of every dollar pre-tax is our profit. Okay? Really low profitability in our industry, but yet we're doing it because people are entrepreneurs and they want that control and the flexibility of their schedule and the ability to have something that they call their own. We are an industry of first opportunity. So all of our teenagers that are out there are... Uh, Gen Ys that are coming up and getting their first jobs are doing it in our industry traditionally. And we are an industry of second chances. When we have a release of uh, our incarcerated that are coming in and having to have rehabilitation and looking for vocation, they're coming into the food industry. And because we have a labor market that is uh, short in our industry because we have grown through, and this is my opinion and maybe something to be researched, but and it's something I really think relates to Damon, because we have, we are in California, our society of entitlements, we have trained a generation of children not to look as work as the alternative to pull themselves up and to make themselves better. And we see that in our labor pool right now. We are an industry of faces of diversity. 60% of our restaurants are owned by people of color. That is Hispanic, Black, Asian, Pacific Islander, Native American. You know, compared to 45% of all businesses in the state of California, that are owned by people of color. That 45% is that number. Front of house, we have managers, 64%. Back of house, cooks, 80% are people of color. Management, 70% are people of color. We're the fastest growing industry in the fast casual sector, and that is a direct relationship to the rising minimum wage. We cannot afford to have full service staffing of restaurants in the fast and the family casual dining which we are because it is in eating 
in eroding at that very thin profit margin of our of our bottom line. So what are we seeing? We're we're looking at technology. Our model is changing, and this is a direct result of what's happening across the street in our capital. In San Francisco, which prides itself on being a very progressive city, having mandated health insurance, uh, sick leave, things that we, we now have to provide. They lost 1,000 restaurant jobs in 2018 compared to, uh, at the end of 2018, compared to their restaurant uh, openings. So now they are very concerned about what's happening in their, their restaurant industry. And, uh, and it's directly related to for, uh, labor cost, food cost, housing costs. When I talk to my restaurant tours in the San Francisco uh, East Bay area, it's, you know, Lorraine, we can't find employees to work that live within the radius of our business. And therefore, in, or when we find somebody, the natural market forces of competition, we are going to pay a higher rate. But that's going to be because we are choosing to do that because of market forces, not because it's mandated. Um, so what I see is that the restaurant industry, the class of full service, is, is being eroded. And when we look at what, how many restaurants opened last year, 60% were on that fast casual spectrum versus the full service spectrum. We're using technology to replace front of house jobs. How many of you have walked into a quick service restaurant or a fast casual restaurant and you're ordering from a kiosk? Or we're ordering from apps on our phone, right? Or I know the gig economy representative is not here today, but we, we are training people to order from Postmates and Grubhub and Uber Eats. But, and yet we as an industry have a bit of challenge with that because we, don't, we can't control the guest experience. And if there's a problem with your order and that when you're ordering from those third-party delivery systems, it's our reputation that's impugned, not the third-party delivery that's impugned. And so we are working on some uh, <laughs> legislation with that as well right now. Um, when you have an increase in minimum wage, it's not just the straight wage. It's the increase in workers' compensation contribution. It's the increase in payroll taxes. It is also the wage gap between those that are earning over the minimum wage and expect to have more uh, and ha keep that gap with them. So um, I encourage you to look at uh, research that was done by UC Riverside and the School of Business and their Center for Economic Forecasting and uh, where they found that employment growth has slowed due to rising minimum wage and especially, especially will be affect the Central Valley where I'm from and the Inland Empire if we go into another recession. I want to remind you that restaurants are great contributors of their communities. As I said, we're the number one generator of sales tax. That sales tax, tax translates into public safety budgets, into education budgets, into the contribution to nonprofits that keep nonprofits going. We are very generous through thin m margins, our industry is very generous in giving back and supporting its community. Um, so, you know, as wages rise, I mean, these California policymakers should be th th need to think about whether their ideas are really helping small businesses and people or just making it impossible for us to keep on growing our business. Because what's happening is it's, I think Damon said it, or I heard it said, death by a thousand cuts, and that's what's happening. And we talk about the food, I'm gonna close with talking about the food trucks. Food trucks are on the rise because it's a lower cost of entry to get into instead of a brick and mortar. And we have had several that have gone to brick and mortar, and after two years are closing their brick and mortar because their food truck is lower cost with the rising minimum wage. They can run it themselves, they can be more profitable. So I think you know we need to be talking about regulators. Great, um, you know, people think they've got great ideas for legislation. They haven't signed the front of a paid check, uh, but there's a lot of unintended consequences. So thank you. So I have a couple of questions for the panel, and then Evan will be going around with the microphone with questions for you all. So. Maybe Lorraine, following up on that point, um, you know, as someone who every day has to navigate all of these regulations and taxes and these other wonderful ideas that come out from across the street, I'm going to make you queen for the day. Okay. What do you think is the most important policy change that 
the legislator, a legislature should pass this year to help businesses like yours and other entrepreneurs just starting out? Well, I'm going to say, number one, repeal PAGA. <laughs> if that could if that could be repealed because that is causing a lot of um, unnecessary lawsuits I mean I, I have faced I haven't faced a PAGA lawsuit but we have recently faced uh, you know uh, uh, wage in our lawsuits that you know are unfounded it's just something that we in our level of employment that we that we're going to get a percentage of that and smaller businesses can't afford that on the bottom line and certainly we have EPLI insurance but uh, you know they're they're um, only going to pay so much and you're going to be paying out of your out of your your pocket but the w related to PAGA and could you maybe explain what is PAGA oh, I'm for sorry. those who don't know? So the, it's called the Private Attorney General Act, which allows an employee to sue you on behalf of the state. Okay. Sometimes this can s certify and turn into a class action suit. Um, and you hope that that's not what happens. Am I, am I right, John, in that? <laughs> with that. So uh, what has happened now in this current year is because of the uh, Me Too movement and, and the sexual harassment claims, there is now, if you file against an employer, you have the look-back period is four years now, where it was three years. This was just effect of 2020. So you know, there are people who have held off on filing lawsuits until the beginning of January, February, because now the look back is 2020, and their hope is that they're going to be able to get more in uh, a settlement amount for uh, penalties and interest on whatever may be owned, whether it's founded or unfounded. So this is really an area for small employers, mid-employers to, to really worry about. The other thing is the ADA. Okay, ADA is not just the physical barriers anymore to enter your business. It is, is your website ADA compliant? And your website, and you should have, you have a, if you have a business website, please have your um, IT person check to make sure that it's ADA compliant. Because there is somebody sitting in a room in LA in their pajamas who is visiting websites and then filing lawsuits over the internet and you're getting served. And to settle one of these is running anywhere from maybe two to $4,000 because you're gonna settle versus engage and pay an attorney to fight it because you just don't have that money to engage uh, with, with the attorney and fight it. So uh, ADA reform, the last time we had some ADA reform at the state level, this is a federal issue, okay, but uh, was AB, uh, Senate Bill 269, and that allowed that if you had a certified inspection report by a certified access inspector, and you had that, it limited your liability if you were sued by a plaintiff for any ADA violation. And we as the Restaurant Association, we have worked you know, to, to push this through, but we've had other things that have happened. What's currently on the legislation is restrictive scheduling. And so what that means is that we have to provide an employee, the way it's written, with a schedule three weeks in advance. So we hire them. We have to provide a schedule three weeks in advance, really a four-week schedule. And let's say in the restaurant industry, which happens, you want to have a party and you call us and we've put a three-week schedule out. If we have to schedule additional people and not have given them that three-week notice to accommodate and serve your party, we will be liable for penalties, which they're talking about, I think, in the legislation, something like $4,000. I mean, this is really ridiculous amount of money. What does that do? I mean, that's impeding business and our ability to make money and our ability to be able to provide jobs. And I will tell you that our workforce, because many of them are students, or they're moms, we employ a lot of moms, single moms, uh, that want to have the flexibility to be able to be home for their kids. So they want to go to school. They want to work as many hours as they can within the short amount of time, whether that might be a back-to-back -back shift, but that would be prevented in this type of legislation. So this, this is the type of things that we're facing that cost us money, cost us penalties, the unintended consequences of protecting employees. 
John, kind of along those lines, I'm going to have you get out your crystal ball at this <laughs> legislative session. What either positive or negative issue for small business that will be debated across the street next year do you think will have the biggest impact on small businesses and entrepreneurs across the state? Yeah, so, and you're talking within the Capitol building. Yeah. Yeah. So I still believe that the debate will continue uh, in the Capitol and in the courts as it relates to AB5, to the independent contractor discussion and, de and debate. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's outrageous, you know, and, and uh, Lorraine spoke about PAGA, the Private Attorney General Act. The sad thing is the PAGA is kind of like this boa constrictor that kind of slithers its way in and out of pretty much every piece of onerous legislation in California. There's always these, as, as Bob Naylor and others remember back to those days, even the fines, penalty, and right to sue. It's that phrase that's in there that is woven into so much policy. Um, but AB5 is going to be a discussion. You know, while, while we hear from some folks who are strong proponents, now there's buyer's remorse in some ways. Uh, some are standing steadfast that they don't want to change at all on this. Um, we at NFIB have believed in uh, reforms that will help all small businesses. That is going to help. These, I said, I've said that the, this crop of legislators would make really, really great dairymen and dairy women because they're really great at making Swiss cheese legislation through this. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing carve-outs. And what I've said is for various uh, industries and for various folks who are trying to get their exemptions, must be nice. It's kind of the three words I keep using. Must be nice. But, 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 it, but it's, you've got to think about the majority of small businesses out there who don't and the confusion of it, okay? So we look at something as far as for those of you who you should take a look again with your attorneys or others if you are a business, um, you know, doctors and podiatrists are exempt. Chiropractors uh, and optometrists aren't. Okay, so how is this, how is playing God with legislation um, made this way? So, um, Tim, I would say that that's going to be a big issue that's going to be debated. We have seen a lot of legislation. Uh, we've seen Assemblyman Jay Obernolte pr provide some promising legislation. And again, I know he's in the minority party there, so we're keeping good hopes. But I think he's, he's having a lot of good discussions about ways that that can be a good bipartisan way to fix this, which is making sure that every business, that there's a business-to-business -business exemption um, so we're going to see that, and I think we've seen some other legislation, uh, frankly, on both sides of the aisle. We're hoping that we see folks that realize we need to make this work for all of Main Street. Uh, but the challenge is that it's, it comes back to entrepreneurship. We are hearing from people on the left, on the right, in the middle, that I, I am, a, as Lorraine said, I'm a single mom. I'm a parent. I want that. Or I'm a senior. I am a student out in college right now. I like that flexibility. I want that flexibility. It works for me. And in a state where we have the highest sales tax, income tax, regulations, lawsuits, and challenges to even own your own business, to be able to have uh, one or two different opportunities to make that income, to provide for your family, now that's being strict, stricken. So that is what we would probably see as the big issue. And then the only other thing I would say is probably the second one that we'd like to, we probably probably see some fixes or some opportunities is um, if there is an opportunity to help fix that uh, Privacy Act. You know, I don't think, I think that's going to be more of a regulatory with the Attorney General in July, but we might see some folks trying to get some, some sorts of additional fixes on that and clarification. So hope that helps. Well, I want to make sure that you all get the chance to ask questions, so I'm going to let Damon have the first question that you all ask. So Evan is wandering around with the microphone. Uh, thank you. Well, uh, I was inspired by what Lorraine said. It's the, un you know, the unexpected consequences. And Damon, in your work with poor, poor people, with people who have not gotten all the opportunities along, don't they get a voice too? I mean, shouldn't we take a year to think about this knee-jerk barf up a AB5 solution to a problem? Oh, they can't get health insurance, so we'll make them employees. Shouldn't the community, particularly those who've been disadvantaged, have an opportunity to look at these bills? Did you know that writers, if I write 30 articles for an, an employer, I'm an employee. They'll cut me back to avoid that, you know, because uh, I'm self-employed. Shouldn't they, people have at least a year to look over the bill, to talk about it, to see whether there wasn't another way to solve that problem? Because we're just having knee-jerk reactions to everything. 
And I, you know, particularly with what your inspiring story, I'm thinking that's a group that needs to be heard from, but I'm absolutely sure they don't get a voice. They don't get it. They're not going to get it. I mean, we have a super majority here in California, state legislature. Ultimately, the voices that are speaking in this are much louder from the direction they want to go to score points, to be able to get higher office, to be able to go back and talk about the progressive policies that they were able to get passed. I mean, that's really where we are. So giving them time, assuming you had the right people to go in and educate them, there's just a class of people, which are where I grew up, you know, that are people that are living on subsistence, as Lorraine talked about, from the government. And it's, I call it the new slavery. You, you can't get out. You can't go above that barrier because you'll lose all your benefits. So your whole life, you make as little money as possible so you can get all your government benefits. And guess what? Now you pass that down to your children. And there's just class of, there's a whole class of people that are stuck there. They can't get out, don't want to get out. So they remove the shackles and the chains. And now it's, they're shackling them with public policy. And we, you, if we had the right voices, if Lorraine could go and talk to every single person and tell them what the pros and the cons were, then you, you, would, you would have a really good point. I think that she would win the more people than what the other side are actually saying uh, with the arguments that they've made here today, both her and John. But unfortunately, the people they're hearing from in their community, the community organizers, the local politicians, the civil, excuse me, the, the city council members, their state assembly members, they're all telling them the message they want to tell them that works for their policies and for their promotion in, in politics. Other questions? Yep. Uh, uh, good afternoon. My name is Frederick. I work in economic development and have an observation and a question. My observation is, so I often write to my state assemblymen about issues that businesses are facing, and guaranteed I get the same form reply. We're the fifth largest economy. <laughs> they, they, they stick to that thing, and who cares if you're the fifth yeah. largest economy if your business community is hurting? I've literally had businesses say, I'd rather be part of the 20th economy if I can get a housing for my employees and I can manage and run my business. That statistic is meaningless. And that is what they often talk about in Sacramento. Um, in regard to AB5, I'm just curious. If someone who is a sole proprietor is now considered an employee, right? But what if they, what if they incorporated? I, I'm just curious, right? What if that sole proprietor is now their own corporation? Oh, sorry. If I'm correct, I'm going to have to double check it after what somebody said today. If you, if that employee becomes a single member LLC, uh, then I think that uh, it's within that a, a particular carve out that I get to enjoy, but you may not. <laughs> I think somebody behind you's got to oh, uh, right here in the middle, Evan. Thank you. Um, I'm trying. Damon, I'm trying to be optimistic, but it's really hard after hearing all of you and after I saw the demonstration outside today across at the Capitol. You know, you um, I have made some notes here so I don't forget. I, I'm wondering how we can get the message of reason and fact out to the general public as well as the legislature. It's like they don't want to be confused with reason. They don't want to be confused with facts. They don't really care if it hurts the little guy who they're trying to help as long as they look like they're helping, and I'm very pessimistic about that. I think those in uh, the, the majority party who are more moderate are threatened by those who, who aren't, and so when they try to raise their voices in response to reason, they're beaten down, and I don't know how you would, any of you would address that. Um, this, the feeling of entitlement and also statistics. I mean, do they really know across the street how many of our small businesses close in response to the, the uh, regulations that are put out there? And it has to be good. It can't be it was a poor business owner. It has to be good in response to what is the unintended consequences, I think you were calling that. And how many have moved out of state because they're just giving up and going to where uh, they will be more successful. And do the legislators not think about if restaurants are the largest contributor to the sales tax, what would happen if you could demonstrate as a group and close down for one day 
and take that tax money and you know show how much taxes they would lose from you guys these are just some ideas as a pessimist and i'm thinking if we go over and demand john they're not going to listen to me they're not going to listen to the people in this room what else can we do the, the, the short, i'll give you a short answer short answer is nothing uh, but the, if you were able to do one thing uh, it would be gerrymandering has really killed the state we have a super majority now by gerrymandered districts both in the state senate and the state assembly and when you have a super majority that all votes blue you're in trouble there are probably you know i would say from 2000 and from 2000 to 2010 you probably had enough purple districts to where you were able to keep a super majority out and you obviously had some input from both sides especially in those districts uh, and now in the state legislature both the state senate and state assembly it's blue super majority and when you have that you have to vote the way the leader says vote the majority leader and the uh, the speaker can i answer yep. okay so you know in terms of advocacy that's where a lot of our trade organizations come in nfib cra manufacturers association uh the uh, chamber of uh, state chamber of commerce and their their um, political action committee you know we go back to building relationships at the local level in each of our areas with our legislators. That's really important, getting to know our school board trustees because they're gonna be the next council people who are gonna be the next assembly members and, and, and senators. So that's where we really work hard as well as at the Capitol and telling our, telling our stories. But we're really now working on educating our employees you know, about the challenges. Uh, yesterday, it, this, I got a call at, after 2.30 that uh, Secretary of State um, Alex Padilla was coming to a town hall meeting in our um, hometown of Selma and was going to stop at the restaurant and would I be there? And I said, I'm, I'm unfortunately, no. I said, I, I, it's my birthday yesterday. I have, <laughs> my husband has a celebration planned. But, you know, we, are, we welcome him and we welcome the opportunity to talk with him. That relationship in his, and he called me personally to sing happy birthday to me. And that relationship was built eight to nine years ago when he was a, uh, a, a, a senator. And it was through the Restaurant Association and a fundraiser. So you never know when your relationships are going to come into play, but it's important that we build them at the local levels as well as at the state and at the national level. Then I just want to say by getting your employees involved in educating, you know, it makes them more an informed voter in these situations. And I'm one of the employers who's willing to have the discussion if they voluntarily want to have that discussion because I don't want to be charged under PAGA of, <laughs> or some other legislation of uh, being sued or uh, accused of influencing them. But, it's, but this, is, this is how NFIB, CRA, all the other organizations work together to try to have influence. Now, we know we're a blue state, so we know that supporting a Republican candidate in a district that is going to, you know, that's going to have a um, a, a blue majority uh, may not be where we should put our resources. So if you've got two Democrats that are running, it's who do we have the most influence? Who is the more moderate? So we are having to work in the supermajority at looking at getting moderate candidates elected in the districts, and so and and educating them. And so an example of your friend, your, the enemy of your friend, it, the enemy of your enemy becomes your friend. Well, this was the situation with um, a legislation that is being sponsored by Lorena Gonzalez uh, regarding the third party delivery, uh, Postmates Grubhub, and making sure that we as business owners get to own that data and know who that customer is. I have been in her office to talk to her about legislation that has been restrictive to businesses. I'm not in her I'm not in her district, but I can speak to the people that she's trying to help because they're my people of color. And so, you know, so she'll she'll listen, but this is the first time after 8 years that you know or or less that we have been able to come together on something that we could find to support. So you never know. Building relationships is important and you never know when they're going to come into play. And I think on that note, we're sadly out of time for this panel. We won't, I won't sing, 
but <laughs> let's wish Lorraine a very happy oh, birthday, happy and please thank our panelists for a wonderful discussion. Happy birthday. Okay. Thank you. Special thanks to John Cabotech, Lorraine Salazar, and Damon Dunn. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or TuneIn. And please do us a favor and give us five stars. You can also listen to our podcast on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash pacificresearch1. That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Marina Echon. Hope you'll come back again for next round with PRI.